Hi, I'm Ed Sproing. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm at Sonix today with Drew Wingard, the Chief Technology Officer, who's going to talk to you about IP integration. What sort of problems are you seeing with the integration? We have this ability to um, produce chips um, very rapidly. The, the tools and methodologies exist for implementing designs quickly, um, but when we moved from ASIC designs to SOC designs, we went through a step function and functionality, and we had to integrate microprocessors together with memory controllers and, and a large number of accelerators kind of for the first time. At that point was kind of the dawn of the third party IP business, which said, well, some of these functions I'm gonna reuse. Um, it doesn't make sense for every design team to go do this from scratch, and so I'm gonna put this thing together. And there were industry initiatives like the old uh, Virtual Socket Interface Alliance, um, that were designed to try to support the, the original creation of this block, the mythical reusable IP core, which will draw just as this simple block. Um, typically that block has a set of interfaces on it. Um, some we don't talk that much about in, in, in the kind of designs I'm working on. You know, there's clock signals coming in and reset signals and any variety of test signals. But we really don't focus much on those um, in the early phases of an SOC design. What we're really worried about is, how do I take this block, which I didn't design, and um, understand enough about it that I can integrate it together with other IP functions into a very large chip? And of course, some of these things were designed five, ten years ago. Some of these are designed by engineers that work at my same company who don't work here anymore. Um, a lot of them are being licensed, hopefully, for, in from the outside world. Um, they come in many different shapes and sizes. Um, one thing that we recognized early on is um, each of them has their own function, and some of them do that function largely by themselves and interact with the rest of the chip only via the interface to the on-chip system network. Um, others are I.O. cores, and so they have an interface to the on-chip system, and they've got an interface via pads off-chip. Um, others act like, you know, perform a memory function, so maybe they're a memory controller, or maybe they are an embedded SRAM inside the chip. Um, we have to put those things together into a working system, and we have to deal with a couple of fundamental things. Because they were designed by different teams at different times, it's very likely that each one of their interfaces may be different. So I might have some core from a while ago that was built using the old AMBA HB interface. Um, I, I may have a, a relatively new peripheral built using the AMBA XI3 you know, version or XI version 3 specification. I might have some uh, oh, I don't know, processor IP built using the OCP specification. Um, I might have memories that have you know different widths. My my path to DRAM might be 128 bits wide. My path to the SRAM uh, maybe is only 64 bits wide. Um, the job of the on-chip network and the job of the integration team is to put all these things together into a working system that makes sense. Um, so pretty quickly you see that I have to deal with a set of protocol issues. Um, I've got different um, somewhat incompatible protocols that have to be managed together. I've got different um, interface data widths, and so I've got to do width conversion. Um, what has changed a lot over the past five years is how important it now becomes to worry about other issues, um, specifically the clock frequencies involved, and closely related is the supply voltages or power domains that are involved with these IPs, because, you know, Six or seven years ago now, Intel admitted that um, we were, we'd reached the end of what we could expect to do in terms of increasing performance by increasing the operating frequencies of our microprocessors. And so we started multiplying the number of cores, but the other thing that, that came with it was the requirement of um, minimizing power. And so we now see the requirement that these different components may each have their own clock. They may each be in their own power domain. And so now the, the on-chip network and the, and the system integrators decide how in the world are we going to deal with all that. Um, the conventional approach has been you, you cross that clock and power domain boundary 
as a function of the IP. But that has a set of challenges associated. One is, um, most of these IP components weren't designed to live in their own clock and power domains. Um, and so it ends up being a job for the integrator of the chip to try to figure out how to cross those boundaries safely. They also weren't designed necessarily to coexist next to something else too, right? That's correct. So there's all kinds of interesting problems. Some of those problems happen down at the domain of the physical design. We worry about crosstalk and um, sharing the same supply voltages and things like that. Um, but other things about around interoperability are just the, if I'm going to put something into a separate power domain and I want to be able to shut it down, I need to be able to shut it down safely uh, in a way in which it doesn't negatively impact the rest of the system. So a, something that we've been working on for the past couple of years is we think that the job of crossing the clock and power domain boundary should be a job of the network itself. Because by crossing those domain boundaries inside the network, we can do it in a safe, consistent fashion, and we can put the intelligence about which of these power domains are currently on and off in a centralized place inside the network. So that we can know, for instance, that if a packet comes in off this interface that wants to go to this DRAM and he's powered off, that um, the network itself can alert the microprocessor, hey, we have a problem here. We're trying to access someone. Or we can send a signal to a power manager that says we need to turn this domain back on. And that power manager can then, in hardware, go sequence the domain, bring him back on, and then the transaction that we were waiting for is actually allowed to flow through the network and do his job. So it's the same idea as you have in your laptop's uh, Ethernet card uh, or Wi-Fi wireless card where you can do the wake-on activity or wake-on LAN. So people talk about reliability of IP as a, an issue of how do you determine reliability, but it's not just the reliability of the IP itself, right? It's how it's connected into the system. Yes. So um, one of our customers did a survey of their internal bug database from one of the big SOCs some years ago. Um, and it was when they were still kind of handcrafting their own um, on-chip fabrics. And they found that fully two-thirds of the bugs, pre-silicon bugs, that they had in their chip database um, arose from communication issues between IP blocks. Um, you know, sometimes it was the case that uh, the interface specifications weren't as clear as they could have been. Um, sometimes it's the case that there was um, just a, an outright bug that wasn't caught at the local test bench level for the IP component. And sometimes it was the case that in order to actually create this problem, there had to be the interaction of three or more of the IP components in the systems. So one of the things that we get by adopting a network style approach here is really an isolation of concerns. So, you know, we think of this as each of these IP components, you know, essentially has a contract between the IP component and the element we call the agent, which is right inside the network. And so we want to very carefully validate that part of the system. And then the connections in between the agents you know, are the domain of our hardware, which, of course, we can exhaustively pre-verify you know, before we've ever delivered the IP to our customers. And so we want to break these concerns. The, 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 the academics call it separation of concerns. You want to be able to br break it into you know, different pieces. How do those um, problems show up? Is it too much power being consumed? Is it performance is not there? What are you seeing? So, um, well, the worst way they show up is they can show up as an actual functional defect in the chip, which is there's something that the chip was supposed to be able to do that it can't do reliably. And so you are left with two choices. Um, if the frequency of the occurrence is low enough, you might let it, let it happen. And then you rely on things like the watchdog timers that are on the chip to actually allow you to reset whenever bad things happen. More commonly, people look for a software level workaround to defeature the chip in some way so that they won't let the um, IP get into the place where it can trigger the error. Um, it can be very difficult to isolate and find the root cause of those errors, especially if the system has already shipped. Um, you know, into consumers' hands. Um, so that's, that, that's a possible way. Um, more frequently, 
we find, um, especially with respect to power management, that um, there's a new class of deadlocks that shows up where um, you know, the, the signals required to turn on a power domain may pass through another power domain that can also be switched off. And if you're not careful about the sequencing, um, you can get this into situations where you can't turn on the guy you want to because someone else is off and you can't turn him on because the first guy's off. And so you can end up with power management deadlocks and, and we have seen a number of designs uh, that show up that way. So um, does the chip functionally correct? Well, it's functionally correct as long as you don't try to exercise all the power management functionality, which isn't usually a um, requirement for the proper operation of the system, but does have big impact on things like battery life. To some extent, correct me if I'm wrong, but what you're doing here is taking the idea of intelligence scheduling and now moving it out into lots of different areas. So scheduling for power, scheduling for how signals move through a uh, design, scheduling what's on and off at any one point, scheduling how, uh, how fast things are running and what's being used. So I think scheduling is an interesting way of phrasing it. Um, the way I've normally thought about it is um, we have, the, at the level of the on-chip network, we're dealing a lot with protocols. I've got these interface protocols here, and at a, at a starting level, an engineer could, could rationally think, hey, all i got to do is hook these protocols together and I'm done. Um, the view that Sonics has taken is a bit different from that. And, and the question we ask ourselves is, what are the facilities, what are the features that we can have that makes the system more resilient and reliable? And so when we think of protocols, we spend most of our energy thinking about the protocols inside here. And the extra hardware that we can put into the agents so that we can abstract these interface protocols into and get them into essentially common language. Once we're in a common language, um, then it's much, much easier for us to reliably build the, the network that goes in the middle. Um, and that's not to say that this isn't layered, uh, like, like all people who talk about networks. If you looked at the protocols that are running you know, in between our, an SGN router and an SGN agent, you'd find that it is a uh, more of a data link level protocol. It's not at the same um, level of abstraction as the interface protocols like an AXI interface. Um, but it is the case that what we think of is the boundary of our box is this system that has a set of characteristics. And we believe by putting more intelligence into the protocols, um, we can avoid a lot of the problems that plague teams trying to do integration. Where's the bottleneck? I mean, we're always thinking about performance. We're always thinking about dropping the power, which are sort of flip sides of the same thing. Where do you see the bottlenecks and how do you solve them? So, so that, I think, is application domain specific. Um, for many designs in the consumer space, um, the purpose of integration is to reduce cost at a given function. Um, and the main way that integrating reduces cost isn't really about getting more digital stuff on the same chip instead of two chips. It's about sharing external DRAM. So if I had the same amount of function on two different chips, they would each need their, sep their own separate DRAMs. And from a system bill of materials perspective, those DRAM chips end up eating a large part of it. So as we integrate functions together, well, what happens is the bottleneck, the point of contention, becomes this path through to memory. So when we talk about sonics and protocols, you know, we've spent more of our protocol design dollars on trying to make sure we can make this path as efficient as possible. Um, one way of trying to keep the on-chip system out of the way of getting to peak DRAM performance is to build the design where the memory controller has many separate physical interfaces. In fact, we've seen some designs where there are 20,000 wires at this point. Why? Well, the, the critical resource in the system is the off-chip interface to the DRAM system. We want to run this interface at the highest possible throughput we can so we can serve the largest number of on-chip cores. 